Number 1. Ephesians, 3rd Quarter, 2023. John Pauline. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to start lesson number one on the Ephesians, and our moderator is going to be Dr. John Pauline, and Jane is going to offer our opening prayer. Kind and loving Father, in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we want to thank you as we submit to worship you this morning. We thank you so much for the gift of life and salvation. We want to thank you for the opportunity to study the book of Ephesians, O God. We want to thank you for your love and mercy. And now, dear Jesus, as we get on board to do this discussion this morning, we invite you, Lord. May you guide our discussions. May you guide our facilitator, John Pauline, today. May you also touch our faculties, O God, and every word that we say, Lord, may it come from you. We also want to pray, everlasting Father, that wherever these waves shall land, in every island on land and wherever, O God, we pray that everyone will see you, Jesus, and be drawn to the cross. Be with us now and forevermore and bless each and every one of us, O Lord, for we are all your children. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. All right, we are beginning a new series, and it is on the letter to the Ephesians. And in the very first of these lessons, instead of focusing primarily on the book, we will focus more on the book of Acts, because the book of Acts gives us the background of Paul and the Ephesians. And if you'll go to number one in your handout, you can see a summary of those interactions in the book of Acts and beyond. It says there, there are four major interactions between Paul and the Ephesians in the Bible. Around AD 52, Paul makes an initial brief visit, and we'll touch base on that, Acts 18. From roughly AD 53 to 56, Paul actually resides in Ephesus, and this is particularly chapter 19, uh, talks about those three years. On his way to Jerusalem in AD 57, Paul meets with the elders of Ephesus in Miletus, and that's found in Acts chapter 20. So you see in the book of Acts, there's three interactions of Paul with Ephesians, and in fact, he spends more time in Ephesus than anywhere else except Tarsus and maybe Antioch. So Paul is clearly very, very interested in this city and in the church members that reside there. But then, Finally, around AD 62, Paul writes his letter to the Ephesians, probably from prison in Rome. So there's four major encounters. Most of this quarter's lessons, we'll be looking at the letter to the Ephesians. But in this particular study, we'll look more at the book of Acts. So the lesson begins asking the question, read the entire letter to the Ephesians. It should take you 15 minutes or so. As you go through the letter, look for the four major metaphors Paul uses for the church. And so this question is particularly for those who studied ahead and went through the letter to the Ephesians once. And the question is, did you find metaphors of the church in there? And from the look on your faces, I suspect you're saying, what is a metaphor? Would be a figure of speech. Maybe it'd be simpler to just go ahead and note that there are four major metaphors. But here, Sean's going to give it a shot. Go ahead. I will speak to the two that are quite obvious, and that's the body uh-huh. as church and armor as in protection in warfare. So there's two. Very good. Yes. Uh, the body of Christ is one metaphor of the church. Obviously, the church isn't the body of Christ in a physical, literal sense, but it's using the body and what people know about the body as a metaphor for how the church functions. Also, the armor of God or the army of God, a military metaphor. Very good, Sean. All right. The other two that are most widely noted are the temple. The church is a living temple with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone and the bride of Christ. When husband and wife interact with each other in a godly way, Paul says that reminds him of Christ and the church. So the idea of the church as the bride of Christ. So we have four here, the body of Christ, the living temple, the bride of Christ, and the army of Christ. So which one of those attracts you to most? Which one seems to have the most impact while you're thinking about that? Let me just note, for me, it's probably the body and the temple metaphor. Both of those I found very attractive, but I particularly like the body. You know, in the temple metaphor, 
everybody's a stone in the temple. And the idea of being part of God's temple is kind of cool. You know, I really like that. But all the stones are the same. So that's not entirely helpful. The one I really like is the body of Christ because the body has all kinds of different body parts, you know, fingers and toes and toenails and elbows and knees and hands and so forth. The idea that we are all different and yet we're united in Christ, I think is a very beautiful metaphor. Any other reflections on these metaphors for the church? Livius? You kind of blew my mind when you mentioned the army the military aspect of it. And it just made me realize that we need others in this fight, in this battle. And I never thought about that metaphor of an army and just thinking what goes into moving a military machine to fight an enemy, all the different parts, kind of like the body. But yeah, the army one is really, I never thought about that before. Well, you kind of blew my mind with your comment here because I hadn't thought in terms of what you just put in there is that when you're in the trench, you're not thinking of saving your country. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking of a whole lot of things. You're just saying, I'm defending my buddies. I want all the guys that I'm here in the trench with to survive this battle. And I'm going to do whatever I can to prevent the enemy from messing with that plan. Yeah. And so the idea of how much we need each other. Yes. And how much each of us can provide safety for others, etc. I think there's a lot more of that metaphor than I'd been thinking of. So thank you for that. All right, Terry. There was a time in my life where this would not have been true. But now I think I kind of like the marriage metaphor. And the reason I say that is because in a good and healthy and safe marriage, there is total acceptance total love, total patience, and creating an atmosphere where there can be growth in a way that is healthy. I'd like to underline a point that you implied, even though you may not have said it as such. The reason there's multiple metaphors is not every metaphor is going to connect with a person at any time or at a particular time. Terry notes that if you're not in an ideal marriage, that metaphor may not work very well. If you didn't have a good father, God as a father may not give the impression that it's intended to give. You see, so these metaphors are very contextual, and we get lots of them because what appeals to one may not appeal to the other. And I think we all have to be careful not to take our metaphor and ram it down other people's throats or imply that they are wrong when they prefer a different metaphor than this wonderful, perfect one that I like so much. You see, recognizing, I think right in there, there's this unity and diversity that God gives us different metaphors. And some people come to the cross in different ways than I would. And yet for them, it's the meaning that right now keeps them afloat. And I need to respect that, even if I don't find that metaphor helpful at all. Henry? On the same lines, I was thinking on the army metaphor that was mentioned, because to me, I was needed to conceptualize in a different way, because for me, armies are sources of arbitrariness based on my context, uh, on my background, abuse, over abuse of power, and all of that. So that metaphor was not aligning very well. So I was not able to see it when you mentioned it because I couldn't consider that as a valid metaphor for the church because that implies the use of force and power in order to overcome the weaker. And so I was having that trouble, although Livius and you saw different perspectives, I was not seeing anyone that was valid for the church. On the other side, I was considering that probably the army, not on our concept from our perspective of human beings, but probably from the perspective of God, that he has an army, but he doesn't use it to overcome anybody, that he has an army, but Jesus tells Peter, don't you know that I have an army that I can summon and come here at any time, but I don't actually use it for that purpose. It's an army of witnesses. So I was trying to see it in a different perspective, in a representation of the character of God, that that army has absolutely no relationship with what we know an army to be in our relationship here in Earth. Yes, absolutely. Fantastic, Henry. And it reminds me of a professor of mine who used to say that metaphors don't stand on four legs. You know, a chair needs four legs 
to sit comfortably, all right? If you have only three, it's a bit unstable, you see. And metaphors are not four-legged items. They can be very, very productive when used in the way that they are intended to be used. If you talk about onward Christian soldiers marching us to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before, that sounds like the Crusades at their worst, you know. If you actually think of the words, which we often don't do, <laughs> you see, but it's a metaphor to say that this is a cause worth fighting for. This is a cause worth dying for. This is a cause where we all need each other in order to win. And I was as much in that metaphor that is very pragmatic and very fruitful. At the same time, you could easily see how in the Crusades that might have been misused in some terrible ways. Sean? I have always taken strength from the armor, not so much the army or military component here. Due to my work, I have to wear a lot of equipment to do the work that I do in the forest. I work with trees. And just this last week, I had a couple of incidents where I was involved in taking the tree down, removing the tree. And I realized in the process that I did not have one of the tools that I needed right there with me. So I had to hike back to the truck where I have all my tools and get this one piece of armor as it were, that I needed to complete the task. And so over the years, I have been so grateful to be reminded through this metaphor of my spiritual life, really even in the moment, because as I was walking back to the pickup truck to get this particular tool, I was embracing these teachings, at least the ones that I could conceive of after having read these texts all week long, I was thinking as I was walking back, Lord, I really have some greater needs in my life here. So the metaphor has served me very, very well for many years because I wear 40 pounds of tools most of the time that I'm working. And if one of those are missing, I'm not able to do my job the way I need to have it done. So that has been a very precious metaphor. And I realized, and I appreciate your comment, John, that not a lot of people can really relate to that as I can relate to that because they don't walk around with 40 pounds of gear on their back most of the time. But it's been a precious insight and a guide for me to be able to utilize this armor. But you had me excited there for a minute to think that if Sean had been writing Ephesians, the last chapter would be about God's forest rangers, you know. And then I realized, well, okay, but forest rangers probably don't have arrows and flaming cannibals and all kinds of stuff coming their way. So I guess the armor, you kind of need the military metaphor for it to work totally the way, because Paul is specifically, and we'll see this as we get into Ephesians, that Paul is very concerned about Satan in the book of Ephesians, and the power that Satan can exercise on this earth. And fending off that power is a major theme. So yeah, there are probably other ways to go at it, but he was picking a metaphor that was easily, everybody saw Roman soldiers every day. So that would strike at that time. But today, we may choose different metaphors. Yeah. I work with power lines, trees that are very close to power lines. And this week, I was most notably impressed with the great controversy aspect, the larger, broader view that we engage in in this class, in our thinking. Our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the authorities and the cosmic powers of this present darkness. I work around power lines that if I get in contact with those power lines, I will be powder in about a half a second. It will evaporate me. I can't see that power. I can't see that energy. I can't detect where it is. But when I'm close to that energy field, I can feel it because sometimes the hair on the back of my neck stands up, but it really puts me in touch with this universal dimension of the conflict that we are all a part of and the opposing truthful forces that God has been offering to protect me from that negative cosmic power. Thank you for that follow-up. I appreciate it. Awesome. That really brings it home. Appreciate it. Alyssa. As an English teacher, I appreciate Paul a lot in this book. 
And I have to confess that I didn't like Paul as a writer for a long time. But then I noticed how many books were written by Paul in the New Testament. And I said, maybe I ought to take a second look. And he is quite amazing in that he uses these four metaphors. You know, as an English teacher, I teach my students what is a simile and what is a metaphor. They get simile really well because the word like is usually there. Like my love is like a red, red rose. But it's different when they encounter a metaphor. My love is a red, red rose. And Paul, I think, anticipates his audiences, not for just then, but maybe even for the future, and that he uses the four variety of metaphors that will appeal to us the most. And look at the discussion that it has stimulated already. So I really appreciate him as a writer. Yeah. And if you're interested in the New Testament, you probably have to deal with Paul at some point, because he wrote close to half the books of the New Testament, maybe more, depending on Hebrews. Let's go to number three. It says Ephesus was one of the largest and most important cities of the Roman Empire. It had a major port, which was a major source of wealth, and it was the capital of the Roman province of Asia. The protector goddess of Ephesus was named Artemis in Greek and Diana in Latin. At the end of Paul's second missionary journey, Paul made his first visit to Ephesus. So let's Get into that visit, and Terry, if you would read Acts 18, 18 through 21, that will get us started. After staying there for a considerable time, Paul said farewell to the believers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. At Sancrae, he had his hair cut, for he was under a vow. When they reached Ephesus, he left them there, but first he himself went into the synagogue and had a discussion with the Jews. When they asked him to stay longer, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. Then he set sail from Ephesus. All right, so the first visit is fairly short. And for whatever reason, Paul was reluctant to stay there. He'd already been journeying for some time, at least a couple of years, actually, working his way through Galatia and Phrygia up to, and then he gets called to Macedonia, Philippi. Thessalonica, Athens, Corinth, year and a half in Corinth. And then he moves from Corinth to Ephesus on his way back to Jerusalem, Antioch, Tarsus, where he normally spends his time. So Paul is in a hurry for some reason, but he plants some seeds in the synagogue. And then he says, I'll be back. And there's one other thing, not in this text, but in Acts 18, 26, he says he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Now, this is talking about Apollos. A little bit later in the chapter, they heard Apollos and explained things to him. They came with him. They were in Corinth with Paul. They came with him to Ephesus. It doesn't say that they stayed in verse 21. But in verse 26, it's evident that they did, because after Paul left, Apollos shows up and they work with him. Now, that's just a little detail, and the reason maybe to mention it is, do you notice in verse 26, we always talk about Aquila and Priscilla. What's the order in verse 26? It's Priscilla first. Now, in Greek, order has to do with importance. Just a little side note, whenever Aquila and Priscilla are mentioned together in the biblical text, Priscilla always comes first, which would imply that between the two, she was the chief teacher. They took him aside and taught him, but she is mentioned first. Just a little side note, I've often wondered, since the authorship of Hebrews is discussed and is not settled within the biblical text itself, I was always wondering, you know, it's quite different from Paul and yet similar thematically in many ways. Would it be cool if it's somebody who knows Paul that writes the letter to the Hebrews, and if it happened to be Priscilla, that might be. Uh, Luke is another suggestion people have, but it would be interesting if there was a female author of the Bible, and because of the situation at the time, that couldn't be made known. But a little hint here of something special about Priscilla. Moving on to Acts 19, Paul returns to Ephesus for three years, and you have a very interesting event in Acts 19, 13 to 20. 
Then some itinerant Jewish exorcists tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit said to them in reply, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leapt on them, mastered them all, and so overpowered them that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. When this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, everyone was awestruck, and the name of the Lord Jesus was praised. Also, many of those who became believers confessed and disclosed their practices. A number of those who practiced magic collected their books and burned them publicly. When the value of these books was calculated, it was found to come to 50,000 silver coins. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. All right, so Ephesus seems to be a place where some really interesting things were going on. And evidently, most of the believers, the people who came to follow Paul in those three years, were ex-spiritists, both Jewish and Greek, according to the text. And then it says they burned 50,000 whatever currency that was in books. And this is where you get the whole thing about book burning, you know, and people talk about book burning. It all goes back to this place in Ephesus. And so you're wondering there a little bit, is this supposed to be a model for us? You know, whenever we run into a book that we don't like, just to set fire to it, etc. Perhaps that's not the most healthy way of applying scripture, but certainly it was critical in Ephesus. Now, why do people do magic? And by the way, we have found some 250 magical texts from that period in the Greco-Roman world. There's whole books written about it, magical texts in the New Testament world. And so there's a lot of that stuff. There are incantations, etc. We've become familiar with as we study that period of time. And why do people do that? When people have the sense that there's power out there, they can't see it, but sometimes they can feel it and a sense that it's impacting their lives. Magical arts, etc., are ways that people can try to manipulate those powers for their own safety and for their own benefit. And so magical arts are ways that purport, you know, people can manipulate the gods, manipulate the spirits in their behalf. Now, in that context, notice verses 11 and 12 in chapter 19, the verses 11 and 12, And a very, very strange thing here. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that when the handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. All right. Can objects carry spiritual power? Lou. To me, it just is a great picture of how God takes us where we're at. And he dealt with them on their level, their basis of need. And so he used some of the things that they were somewhat familiar with, I guess. But we have a very magnificent, all-inclusive God who just takes people where they're at and goes from there. All right. Livius? Yeah, just to carry that thought, I think God was meeting these people where they were. And the subject here is Paul. These handkerchiefs touched Paul. And so Paul represents God here. So God is rightly represented even by touching these handkerchiefs. And I think it's a fascinating insight on how God's working with these people where they are with all these magic incantations and things like that. Someone wrote in the chat just now about how the sons of Sceva, after this, they saw this whole thing with the hankies and stuff. And so they thought, if I bring up Jesus' name and Paul's name, I can do the same stuff. So they were using it within their context, you see. They were saying, okay, there are names that have power. There are hankies that have power, etc. I think we need to be careful. There are denominations that bless handkerchiefs and send them out to heal people. And you've probably heard on the radio, we will say a prayer over this thing that you buy and it will have great power for you, you know, et cetera. So that these ideas are not totally foreign today. But I think we want to be careful in assuming that what God did here, and it says explicitly God did it. God used Paul, did miracles through Paul, even through his hankies. You see, that it does affirm that God chose to do it then, but it's the only time in the Bible. Sean. 
I have great mixed emotions and mixed thinking about these passages. While I respect and fully appreciate and believe that God is doing what he can do for the people in that context at the time, and he is taking great risk in so doing. Mm -hmm. And I fully appreciate that. However, I have seen played out in my own life by the associations I have, not because of my own confusion about the matter, but the friendships that I have. I have seen where that risk that God takes doesn't turn out so well, not only for him, for God, but for those who fall into this tremendous deception that Satan takes advantage of in their openness. So this verse here, verse 17 of chapter 19, is really the core of what has concerned me for many, many years. This became known to the Jews and the Greeks who lived in Ephesus, and awe fell on them all, and they extolled the name of the Lord Jesus. So the association between this reaction, this awe that falls on them, and Jesus. This association has disturbed me greatly over the years, as I have seen it, you've mentioned, in denominations and people who go to those denominations, in the belief systems that our good Christian friends have. There's great risk in God allowing these misconceptions to go forward. And frankly, John, you would know much better than I or any of us here that theologically, even those who study deeply some of these scriptural truths tend to go down some of these rabbit holes and justify that there are mystical dimensions of the plan of redemption that are justified, and therefore we can display them in our houses of worship, and we can encourage people to believe those things. Example, speaking in tongues is a more obvious one, but there are other ones as well. You've mentioned the handkerchiefs and some of these imbalanced positions. So I have great concern that God's meeting people where they're at is more risk sometimes than should be taken, and it leads to some really deceptive practices and thinking. Thank you. And how many scriptures have been misused simply because God was meeting someone where they were? How many testimonies of Ellen White for Seventh-day Adventists in the room? How many testimonies have been misused out of their context? I love that God takes a risk every time he does this, but he cares enough to do it. A quick observation. Miracles are actually fairly rare in the Bible. They seem like they're everywhere. But actually, if you do a timeline, miracles occur in only three contexts in the Bible. The Exodus, the time of Elisha and Elijah, and the time of Jesus, about a thousand years apart almost. In between, life is very, very ordinary. So we take from some of the miracles of the Bible that they should be happening. You, know, you don't have faith that so they would happen now. Reality is most of the time they didn't happen. And so we can overplay this concept in how we do church. And I would also note in the Gospel of John, miracles are even disparaged. Jesus says, they came to me because of the signs and wonders, but I did not recognize them. You know, the signs and wonders actually hindered rightly understanding who Jesus was. In the Gospel of John, it's subtle, but the scholars of John have seen the pattern that miracles are there to talk about who Jesus is, but they're actually disparaged as vehicles to face. Anyway, enough of that for now. Jane, very interested in your perspective on these things. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I was just also agreeing with everyone that, yeah, this particular event happened and they were using handkerchiefs. There's also another passage in the Bible, I couldn't get it, that says that the sick, people uh, who were sick could lay their sick ones on the road and as someone was passing, their shadow could heal them. Peter, I think that is. Yes, good observation. That is another yeah. one. Go ahead. And in especially other churches, people have gone overboard with the issue of handkerchiefs, especially where I come from. And they use all manner of things. They put water as long as the water has been prayed for and a lot of stuff. But to just add on this, I want to say that the devil is taking advantage and we need to be very careful because he's using that one particular verse. And you see, like someone who was lame was healed by touching an handkerchief. But sometimes it's not true. It's 
a lie. Many times I've seen it is lies. So I just want to agree with everyone that in as much as even now, miracles are still possible, but like you are saying, they are very rare and the devil misuses these activities, especially where I come from. Mm. Thank you. Well said. Appreciate that. Rita? As you say, the verse says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. I'm wondering if, as we know, God meets people where they are, but for these things to be happening, it meant that the people had to go close to Paul. So they had to be in the vicinity to listen, to hear what he was saying. So this is an opportunity for God to speak to these people through Paul when they came to get their bits and pieces touched deliberately or otherwise by Paul. And if the hankies were brought to them by somebody else, it was still exalting the name of Paul within the city as someone of extraordinary significance, somebody that needs to be listened to. And again, risky business, as some have said, we serve a God who cares so deeply that he's willing to take risks at times to communicate with us. Henry. If there is one lesson that I learned through these very confusing statements that we don't typically support today, the lesson is that what the Bible is referring is to a historical fact, something that happened, not necessarily a prescription of what we need or have to do. So the Bible is only relying on what happened at that time and not necessarily something that has to be replicated or has to be used as a rule just because God did it, it will always work. So God runs the risk of telling us the story just the way it was, but he's not trying to make a point. This is the things that I bless. This is the things that I don't bless. I'm just telling you what happened and what was behind. Because interestingly enough, just three chapters before when Paul was in Philippi, there was this girl that was demon-possessed and was saying, this is Paul, and he has the Spirit of God that is speaking for salvation. That was nothing wrong. That was absolutely the true. And actually, Paul goes and casts that demon out of that girl because it wasn't working. So we see the contradiction on the different behaviors, different practices, different acts, and the different circumstances that were happening. On one hand, he allows the handkerchiefs to be used. On the other hand, he doesn't even allow a normal preaching that was actually, in theory, positive and really true to keep happening. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, just the three or four more verses below, we have a demon in that same chapter 19 that actually fights in behalf of Paul, because now he's saying, I know Paul, but I don't know you. And he goes against them, like, I am defending Paul, and this is a demon. Mm -hmm. So we see all of these stories that I think God is basically just letting us know, no adding anything else, not editing out anything, just letting us know what was happening, just to know the diverse ways that he works, but not a recipe, not a prescription to be replicated all over the place. So I love that type of God that acts transparently, not trying to block the information just because it doesn't work for him. He is actually so transparent that won't hide something, even it can be misused in the future. And this is such important implications for hermeneutics, for how you interpret the Bible. Because I think many of us tend to take the Bible as if it's a prescription book written just for us. In every verse, we're trying to look for what is God saying to me through that. And that's not a bad thing, generally speaking. But the Bible, as Graham Maxwell put it, is an account of many, many messy situations that God dealt with. It's a book about God more than it's a book about us. And when you read the Bible in that God-centered way, it has powerful implications for us and for a healthy understanding of Christian life. But stories like this are there because they happened. They are not told necessarily as prescriptions. You know, let's go burn books. You know, Let's go bless hankies. And by the way, my wife handed me a paper and Rita also noted in the chat that a woman who touched Jesus' garment is another example of uh, sacred cloth, or so it seems. God can use those things. And if he does, praise him for it, you know. But it is necessarily a prescription for manipulating God's power, which is what we often do. 
All right, Bob. Taking the verse, you have faith uh, much as a mustard seed, you could move a mountain. I think I'm very loosely translating my recollection. Does that get taken out of context then? I'm not sure we're reading that correctly because I wondered if that's where some of this comes from is people say, okay, sometimes we hear programs on television, for example, there's a healer or evangelist who's suggesting that they can do all sorts of things, but then they'll quote a verse like that. I'm not sure if the translation we have is understood correctly because it does throw that out. It does sound like Christ is saying, well, if you ask in my name, I'll do it. I know this is on the same path we're talking about. Saying that's all the faith that you need for anything to happen, but it's God. Faith is not, see, that's the pagan concept. The spiritist concept is you manipulate God. You manipulate the gods. You get them to do what you want them to do by using these incantations, by using these objects, etc. That's pagan stuff. That's spiritualistic stuff. When that gets applied to scripture, we're in big trouble. You see, God is the one who decides who gets healed, not me. God is the one who decides how. And when it happens, we praise him for that. But to think that a hanky or a garment or a relic or something like that, we can use that to change God. That has satanic overtones, and yet is often widely, particularly in Protestant churches of all things, widely in use. So I think this discussion here has been very, very significant. Aaron? Human nature is to take a shortcut. And so, like you said, getting God to do something just by a simple incantation or whatever, that's like a shortcut Mm -hmm. to actually having a relationship with God. And whatever ritual we have, and many are good, like praying before we eat can become a ritual. A ritual without meaning is superstition, or maybe a more practical way to say it is a ritual without a relationship is superstition, because it's not touching the heart. It's not getting to where it really needs to go. I think you're kind of answering Bob's question there. What Jesus is saying is that if you're in genuine relationship to me, then it opens the possibility to anything that might be beneficial to you, because God can do it, and at times will do it, but not always. You see, so what you're saying is that faith is trust. Faith is that deep relationship. And that's the key. In that deep relationship, we can look to God for whatever we need. And we may not get what we want. We may not even think we're getting what we need, but God will do the very best thing that he can do for us. But we block up the way to God's power when we aren't in that kind of deep relationship. All right, let's fasten our seatbelts. And go to number four, because we're going to look at two huge passages. And for lack of time, I'm going to have Terry just read large blocks, make a couple brief comments, and save the discussion for later. So, Terry, would you go to Acts 19.21 and read through verse 27? Very fun kind of story here. Now, after these things had been accomplished, Paul resolved in the spirit to go through Macedonia and Achaia and then to go on to Jerusalem. He said, after I have gone there, I must also see Rome. So he sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he himself stayed for some time longer in Asia. About that time, no little disturbance broke out concerning the way. A man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the artisans. These he gathered together with the workers of the same trade and said, Men, you know that we get our wealth from this business. You also see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost the whole of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and drawn away a considerable number of people by saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be scorned, and she will be deprived of her majesty that brought all Asia and the world to worship her. All right, so several little points I want to make. First of all, it's a first intimation that Paul wants to go to Rome. He plans to go to Rome. He ends up not doing so on this particular journey, but uh, he's thinking about it, and and that, uh, of course becomes bigger and bigger as you go through the book of Acts. 
Second, this is, as far as I know, the only place in the Bible that mentions tourism. Here you have people making little tourist objects. They're little statues of Artemis or Diana and little icons of the Temple of Artemis, which it was amazing, 60-foot-high columns by the dozen, etc. It was kind of like the Parthenon, but five times bigger in Ephesus there. And so they're making little, you know, tchotchkes. And apparently, the gospel is threatening business, the tourist trade. People come because they hold superstitions about Diana, and they want to see the temple, you know, and they want to see the statue, and they want to take home a little representation of what they've seen, etc. And it makes great money for the silversmiths in town. So you see here that Christianity has become a threat, not only to the religion of Diana, but also to business. Let's go on, verses 28 through 31. When they heard this, they were enraged and shouted, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! The city was filled with the confusion, and people rushed together to the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's traveling companions. Paul wished to go into the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some officials of the province of Asia, who were friendly to him, sent him a message urging him not to venture into the theater. All right, so you have people getting so upset about the impact of Paul's preaching that a riot starts, and they end up going to the theater as a place where the whole crowd can gather. And that theater, by the way, seats about 25,000 people. I had a chance to visit there just a month ago and refresh that image. It was a huge place, so this crowd was tens of thousands, apparently. And it's interesting that Paul, now not only the disciples say, don't go in there, but apparently he made friends with some of the governor's staff in Ephesus, and they were urging him not to go into the theater and risk his life. So he had friends in high places, and that becomes even more evident as we see the rest of the story. Verses 32 through 40. Meanwhile, some were shouting one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd gave instructions to Alexander, whom the Jews had pushed forward, and Alexander motioned for silence and tried to make a defense before the people. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, all of them shouted in unison, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! But when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Citizens of Ephesus, who is there that does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the statue that fell from heaven? Since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither temple robbers nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the artisans with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges there against one another. If there is anything further you want to know, it must be settled in the regular assembly. For we are in danger of being charged with rioting today since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. Several interesting little pieces. First of all, this statue supposedly came from heaven. Scholars think probably it was a meteor at some point that landed in the area, and this was seen as a sign of approval for the local religion. Notice that the city clerk is defending the apostles. They're not blaspheming the goddess. They're not doing anything wrong. They're doing nothing illegal. So Paul evidently had a huge impact, not just on those who became church members, but on those who did not. And so the city clerk must have been a formidable person in the age before microphones and stuff to quiet the crowd and get them to leave. Pretty strong stuff. Last verse, though, in chapter 20, verse 1. After the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them and saying farewell, he left for Macedonia. Hmm. So you wonder as you read that, shouldn't Paul have stayed and accepted his fate? Martyrdom was quite common in those days. Or perhaps the church said to him, Paul, it's better for us if you go right now. It was good for us that you are here, 
But under these conditions, it's better that you go. And it's interesting that the next time around, Paul doesn't. He deliberately skips Ephesus and invites them to come to Miletus, which is about 10 miles to the south, to come to a different port to meet him and give them some instructions. So the story is told here. It's not clear that there's a whole lot there for us to take home and say, well, here's a prescription for our lives. But it shows the way that the gospel impacted, the power that it had, and also the kind of opposition and the reasons for the opposition. Sean? I'd like to suggest, in keeping with your thoughts here, that Paul wasn't necessarily needed there any longer. From the standpoint of when you have the original individual who started this tumult, Demetrius, announcing very, very clearly the truth of the matter. He states in verse 26 that Paul is alienating many people by persuading them that gods made by human hands are not real gods. When you have not only the disciples announcing the truth, but when you have those who don't believe what you're saying announcing the truth, Paul's no longer necessary in that region. Mm. Interesting. Good point. I think we need to move forward here. And I'm going to skip the rest of number four and just go to number five, the intro thought there. Does Paul intended the letter to the Ephesians to be read in the house churches of Ephesus and the surrounding region? Scholars estimate that a typical house church in the first century would include from 20 to 50 members. We think of the church of Ephesus, we probably think of a building with 500 seats or something like that. That isn't the way it was. Paul did rent the hall of Tyrannus while he was there when the synagogue no longer welcomed him. We have no idea how big that hall was, but most of the time churches occurred in houses. Now, there are three different home styles in the ancient world. One was called the domus, and that's the kind of thing you might remember from a movie like Ben-Hur, where you have a central courtyard and a two-story house You know, goes all the way around the courtyard, and that would be big enough for as many as 50 people. And it would include the family. It would include extended family, you know, grandparents and whatnot. It would include slaves. And 70% of the Roman Empire was slaves. So very likely, you know, the majority might be slaves. In addition, there would sometimes be travelers because they didn't have Motel 6 in those days. And travelers would stop and stay for days or sometimes months or in Paul's case, years. <laughs> you know, And so the, the household would be more than just a family. And so when Lydia, for example, came to believe, she had a church in her house, and it would probably be a domus type thing. A second type of house is called the insula, and that's more like an apartment complex or condominium. And there actually is one of those in Ephesus right near the main street. And you can see it's like 20 apartments, an area the size of a football field or so, and people living all together in sort of a semi-communal type thing. The insula house could hold anywhere from 20 to 50 people. The third type is the shop house. And that is where you would have a shop on the main street and behind the shop or above the shop, if it was two stories, would be the dwelling place for those who ran the shop. And Paul probably stayed in a shop house because he was busy there doing his tent making with Aquila and Priscilla, who were also tent makers. So they were probably living above the shop or behind the shop. And a church there might have no more than maybe 20 members, but would still have a place to meet. And they could use the shop as well, close the door and meet in the entire space there. So the typical church back in those days would have been in a home and the individuals there would often have known each other. And if you convert, you know, the head of the house, often the whole household would go along. Let's move to number eight, because we've been talking about powers, demonic influence, etc. And that type of talk is often uncomfortable for us today and puzzling. And I thought I'd ask the question number eight, when Ephesians speaks about demonic powers and authorities, how do such powers work in our world today? In today's world, how would you tell the difference between demonic possession and severe mental illness? You know, some people say whenever it talks about demonic in the Bible that it must be mental illness, actually. Others suggest that no, they both exist and there's a difference between them. 
And to throw the question out, we have some healthcare people here. How would you know the difference between mental illness and demonic possession? Livius. Well, I don't know that I can answer that question, but generally, I think we have to rely on Jesus, on God to do that detection. But kind of related to the same question that you have here, in the section that we just read in verse 27, Demetrius here, and I'm kind of sad because my middle name is Dimitri. <laughs> But Demetrius here portrays a type of Satan. We always talk about stories and characters in the Bible that they were a type of Christ. But what we see here is a type of Satan. And specifically in the phrase, it says, the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing and that she may be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. You know, that sounds like Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, the character of Satan is coming out in this attitude and this perspective that Demetrius has. Mm -hmm. So we could ask the question, who plays the role of Diana in today's world? And can you, as a health professional, how would you discern the difference? And you're suggesting only Jesus would, and maybe you're right. But are there some differences? Hearing the silence, let me suggest a few, because I was asked some time ago at a psychiatric conference to talk on the question of what is the difference between demonic possession and severe mental illness. And I suggested four, and they were well received by people who know. And psychiatrists probably of all professions is most familiar with the demonic. They get the people who are in the worst shape. And sometimes there are things that they cannot explain. If you've never heard of it, a psychiatrist named Scott Peck wrote a book called People of the Lie. And it's about his encounters with demonic possession, which he didn't believe in when he went through school. But he learned about it from his patients. And among things that might be a difference, first of all, if a person hears voices or sees apparitions, and you see them too, that's probably demonic possession. If they hear voices and see images, and they're the only ones hearing and seeing it, it's probably mental illness. So I remember an occasion where there was some presence, where suddenly the entire room went dark, and we all felt a sense of fear. That was not just mental illness being projected by a person onto other people. There was a real presence there. And so that would be one. A second would be supernatural powers. If a person exhibits abilities that they would not naturally have, that's probably demonic rather than mental illness. A third would be objects. If there are objects, if a person has a necklace or earrings or something and they're removed and suddenly the symptoms you know, vanish or gradually fade, that would seem to be an indication of the demonic rather than mental illness. And finally would be if symptoms are resolved through medicine, it's probably mental illness. If symptoms are resolved through prayer, it's probably demonic. These are, again, there's no perfect protocol. But these are things that I have observed and things that others have observed, particularly in the psychiatric profession, that are helpful, at least in an aggregate, to getting some handle on what you're facing. Henry? I would be a little bit concerned about trying to find a parallelism between mental illness and money position, because I believe that probably in, in our society, at least on this side of the world, we can have severe demonic possession and we cannot even identify it. We can probably have it preaching in pulpits before church members and not even identifying it. And I believe that probably we make this association with mental illness and demon possessions and we create and stimulate the stigma Then somebody having a mental illness may be having a spiritual problem. And I think that's one of the misconceptions that religion has made prevalent when a lot of people suffer from mental illnesses that nobody notices, like anxiety, depression, that are have absolutely nobody believing, okay, this is a demonic possession. And on the other hand, Christians say, well, a strong Christians should never be depressed because that's a show that they are not having any faith or not trusting God. So I will be a little bit concerned about this association with mental illnesses and demonic possession. For that reason, it promotes the stigma that there is not necessarily having a relationship. I actually agree with you, Henry. We're in some very delicate territory here, but because that's a central theme of the book, I felt like we should address it, and we will do so again in future lessons, even in more detail. 
I would point out that in my experience and some in the psychiatric profession, there are really three options here. One is where it's truly a spiritual problem, one where it's truly a medical problem, and one where both are involved. And I think where the demonic has been involved, there's almost guaranteed going to be physical, mental, emotional symptoms as well. So you can't just, quote, cast the demon out. There's more work that would need to be done. So the two can often have an interplay. And yes, you're absolutely right. We have to be careful about stigmas, et cetera. At the same time, those who deal with these kind of symptoms do not want to either laugh off the possibility of the demonic or on the other extreme, ignore the medical side in most cases. All right, John. Paul himself defines what demonic possession is in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. And he actually says that we ourselves were under the control of Satan, the power of this world, and the people who disobey God are continuing to be under the power of the devil. So anyone who is disobedient to God, Paul seems to suggest, is under the control of the devil. All right. Jane. I just wanted to add that it is possible to have both someone having mental illness and that person can also be demon-possessed. That's why I'm saying it's really hard to draw a line between the two to know exactly when someone is demon-possessed and also when it's just a pure mental illness. But from my previous experience back at home, is that when people are demon-possessed, usually it's an on-and-off thing. Because like those who are possessed, the demon will come at a particular, the demon will come, attack the person, they can get like convulsions or be acting in a just a different manner. And then other times they are just normal. But those people who are having mental illnesses, like they are mad, it's a consistent thing. So it becomes like their way of life. And many times it keeps deteriorating, like you have given us the point that it has to go through medicine. But for the person who is demon-possessed, it is something that just happens to them. Like when it comes, it happens and they have to be prayed for and no medicine <laughs> will help that out. So I just wanted to add that one is consistent, the other one is inconsistent. Thank Appreciate you. that. I'll make a note of that myself. We have a comment in the chat from a nursing professor researcher who states that people who are involved, engaged in occult practices, that's demonstrable. You can research that, you know, who plays with Ouija boards, who does seances, etc. But those people have a higher incidence of mental illness. Interesting observation. Dan. Satan would like to destroy our concept of reality. And I think he does that in many, many ways. Because the less we can see reality for what it is, the more effective he is. And so if you take example, like someone who chooses to discard normal ways of happiness and chooses alcohol or cocaine or one of those drugs or narcotics, they disturb their feeling of reality. And I think that you can say, well, they did it to themselves, or you can say, who influenced them to go in that direction? And I think many of those people who go down that line, their concept of reality becomes more and more distorted. So are those people demon possessed? Well, I'm not sure that they are in the classical sense that Jane is talking about, but I think that they've certainly been strongly influenced by Satan to create a new and bad reality that has nothing to do with being able to make good judgments between cause and effect and being the kind of rational persons that God would like us to be. So I think this is another way of maybe looking at what it means to be underneath the influence of Satan, a much more subtle area that may transition into other more overt ways. But I think this is probably the way that Satan works most in today compared to maybe in former times. And that brings this discussion very powerfully into the central theme of this class, that ultimately it is about a cosmic conflict. It's about what kind of God we have and about what kind of enemy we have. And I don't want to end on the dark side, okay? So let's go back to number seven, where it says, according to Ephesians 1, what is the central theme of the entire letter? And here, Paul is talking about these dark things because they were realities in Ephesus. It was clearly a center of this kind of activity in the ancient world, and Paul could not preach there without 
encountering these kinds of things on a fairly regular basis. So one has to explore these as possibilities along the way. But for Paul, the solution is found in Ephesians 1, in the central theme of the passage, verses 9 and 10. He has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. All right, so the central issue here, and we'll come back to this section of the letter next week, but the center here is unity in Christ, and it's a universal one. And it's interesting, there's no mention of Satan here. There's no mention of a conflict here. But when it says that God's purpose, and it says it in a bunch of different ways, God has a plan, God has good pleasure, God has a purpose, etc., When all of that comes together, his mission is to unify heaven and earth together in Christ. And that is in Christ. That is the solution. In Christ, we are not going to be harmed by the evil one. In Christ is the way of life that Paul is advocating. And as we close, let me ask a question. We have time for maybe two or three comments. What does Paul mean by in Christ? Does anyone have a thought? Because that's you know, 164 times Paul says in Christ. But what does it mean? If it doesn't come home in something practical in reality, we go away feeling empty. When you hear the concept, I will bring unity in Christ. What is Paul talking about? Henry, go ahead, help us out. At least from my understanding is by means. That's what he's saying. The book of Hebrews mentions that very clearly. He spoke multiple times, many different ways, and he ended up resorting to the Son to make this revelation of this mystery that was not clear to us by those means. So by the mean of Jesus, he brought that unity because we were not able to see it. We were actually not willing to see it because it was visible for others until he came and demonstrated that, and still he was called a demon possessed. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So you're pointing at the concept that it is through Jesus Christ that the revelation comes that we need to overcome sin, overcome Satan, be what God intended us to be. Any other thought? Iris? If we go back to the original problem that we often cite here, that through the fall, we have come under the dominion of the prince of this world. Then through the cross, we have a way to come back and to return under the lordship of creator God, redeemer God, restorer God. And so I think through conversion, through baptism, through turning our lives over to the lordship of Christ, we are gods and we are liberated now to do, to accomplish God's original plan. And I think this being in Christ means that God claims us also as his own. And if anyone, if Satan attacks us, wants to do us in, he is indeed attacking Christ in us. So I think this being in Christ has great spiritual significance. And Ephesians 1 points out that in Christ, all spiritual blessings that are accessible to us, the spiritual blessings in heaven, it even says, I think in verse 3. So that's my understanding. All right, we need to draw this to a close. I'm going to give Sherry a chance because she hasn't talked yet. And then I want to quickly bring this to a close. Yeah, go ahead. I've had three experiences in my life where I have seen the devil in somebody's face and where I have felt very strongly. And all of these were in professing Christians. And I think that what Henry said in the chat is very real that we can't dismiss the fact of the devil in sheep's clothing. And to me, the safety of this is staying in that close relationship with God so that every day, every moment, we are his, we are listening for his voice. It's so easy to be trapped by the lessening of our relationship and the temptations of maybe letting feelings or a desire for control or a desire for all kinds of other things to take hold and to lose sight of what our goal really is and the people we really want to be. And it's very scary to have those experiences of direct contact 
with the devil in a daily life kind of experience that can be very destructive and very destructive to the people doing this. And again, like Jane said, it isn't necessarily all the time evident in those same people. It can be a time when their guard was down, when their feelings were taking over, maybe they were afraid, maybe they were trying for something that they weren't getting, and it can take over. So to me, it's that continuing trust in God, but trying to listen for His voice and be aware that there are dangers in our own thinking that can happen if we don't stay close to Him and live out that life that He offers. This has been a powerful discussion today. Let me just quickly summarize what scholars say about in Christ. There are five different ways that scholars read that phrase, and then we'll close with what I think is happening in Ephesians. First of all is the historical sense. In Christ means being in the cross, in the Christ event, that as in Adam all die, so in Christ all be made alive. There's Adam's history and Christ's history. And when we embrace the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus as our own, we are in Christ in that historical sense. A second is the spiritual sense, that through the Holy Spirit, we have communion with Christ right now. There's the church sense. We're part of the body of Christ. So you're in Christ if you're in the church. There's the eschatological sense at the end. The dead in Christ will rise first. And then there's the ethical sense. We are dead to sin, but alive in Christ. So within the New Testament, there are five different ways of reading in different contexts. I think scholars of Ephesians would say the one that Paul is talking about here is the historical sense. He doesn't mention the cross here. But in Colossians, a parallel passage, almost identical to this one in Ephesians, the cross is mentioned. And it's pointed out that in Ephesians, it's past tense, the in Christ. And that would have to be something that happened before, in the Christ event, in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. That is the in Christ. And therefore, I think it actually comes back to what Henry said here toward the end, seeing the in Christ in terms of the revelation that came through Jesus Christ, through the cross, as we come to a deeper knowledge of God, we are hedged, we are saved from the powers of the enemy. So the mission of this letter, Paul's central theme in writing the letter, is unity in Christ, that this is the place where we all find life and find safety. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for this powerful conversation. So many have spoken. Each has brought something from their own study and their own experience that has impacted all of us. And we pray that we would take these things to heart, that we would have a deeper knowledge of you, but also a more effective way of sharing it with others. May our lives be in Christ. May we see you more clearly through him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.